Anxiety is something that we fear when, you know, we don't know what the threat. So there feels like there's kind of something looming, but it's a poorly defined threat. We don't know exactly what it is. So it's, you know, a lot of what ifs kind of thing, a lot of worry, what ifs. Um, and it tends to be kind of unfocused, whereas fear is very specific and there's a specific threat. Um, if that makes sense. So fear, mm -hmm. you know, the purpose of fear is to keep us alive, okay? It, you know, fear leads us to flee from danger. It puts us on high alert. It causes these changes in the body, right? So we have this fight or flight response. So those of you probably know that really well. Um, you know, especially those of you who, who deal with fears, um, especially those of you who may have phobias and things like that, that, you know, generally the, the phobia is like a specific fear. Um, yeah. But the, kind of the job of fear is to immobilize us, to get us to either fight or flee to be able to stay alive. And there tends to be a, a pretty strong physiological response, an almost immediate physiological <clears throat> to that fear. Um, fear is biologically programmed into us. Some may say that it's the strongest human emotion because it is so linked to our survival, right? So you got to think about it like nature kind of, yeah. you know, makes certain emotions stronger than others, especially when it's linked to survival. So fear, fear is one of those, you know, and back, you know, a long time ago, you know, a thousand years ago, before we lived in relatively safe conditions. Now there are parts of the world that are not in safe conditions right now. So that's a different story. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you're living in a relatively safe con condition, that fear is still programmed into us, right? You know, as if we did not. Um, and it's there to keep us alive. So we can't get rid of it. So even if it's something yeah. that caused a lot of pain for you, um, wishing it away is not going to be helpful because yeah. it's not going to, and honestly, you don't want it to go away. You want your fear. We, you know, that fear, we want to be able to deal with fear that is not helping us, but we don't want fear to go away because fear does protect us. It keeps us from doing, you know, it, it, it keeps us from doing something that's going to jeopardize our safety and it allows us to react quickly when we need to. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, it's yeah. honestly not something that we want to get away from. It is something that we want to learn how to deal with differently, though. Um, but those of you, you know, who have had any kind of, you know, psychoeducation or therapy or anything like that are probably familiar with this thing, the fight or flight response, right? So in this fight or flight response, mm -hmm. that's how we become, you know, mobilized to stay alive, to keep ourselves safe. And we tend to be very self-focused, right? So it's all kind of about me and keeping myself alive. We become on high alert. You know, our energy increases, metabolism increases so that we can like run faster, jump higher. Pupils, pupils dilate so that we can like, you know, our vision is, is um, more clear, accurate. You know, we can see better. Our hearing becomes more acute. Blood flows away from the skin. Um, you know, so those are the fight or flight responses. There's also this thing called the freeze response. Um, those of you who have experienced dissociation have experienced that freeze response. So the freeze response is actually the next level, right? So the brain, when we experience fear, um, the brain interprets the situation. And if the brain thinks that we have a chance of getting out, then it's going to flee. Like that's our first... Yeah you know, flight is the first step that the brain is going to take. But we, and we take that when the brain thinks that, okay, there's a good chance that I can get out of here, right? If the brain feels like I can't escape, then that's where we go into fight, right? Or I, or I can't, mm. um, but, you know, I'm in this state where I can fight. Now, if the brain feels like, you know, I, I can't fight this threat, then that's where it goes into shutdown mode. And that's wow. that freeze response. And in that shutdown mode, basically, you know, um, our mind kind of gets foggy. You know, we're not really kind of taking in things as clearly. We 
um, our pain actually reduces. So, you know, we're, we're kind of not as present, not as aware. And our brain is doing that to protect yeah. us. So that's yeah, just, yeah. And, and you know, a lot of times if you have had trauma and things like that, sometimes we can kind of get locked into that. It, you know, and when we're triggered by a trauma that we can go into that freeze response immediately because the brain is going into like, this is an, an inescapable threat. So mm. I put that down to protect myself physically and emotionally. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I think it's really good know, knowing the difference between fear and anxiety because I experienced both um, and had some experiences, especially here being on the island, I've had a couple of um, <laughs> some real shocking um, situations where one of them was where I was actually attacked by a giant trevally, which is this, this fish that's the size of half a person's body. Oh my I was gosh. out in a training swim, yeah, out in a training swim about 1,500 meters out, still had to come in and yeah, got attacked by this fish. It was um, because I was wearing something shiny, no one had told me, don't uh, wear something shiny yeah. in the water. So they don't normally do this, but it's um, I had a training watch on. Um, and it's interesting because in that situation, I just turned around and just bolted, do you know what I mean? Wow. Like, turn around and just flee for your life. And um, it's quite fascinating afterwards checking my swimming pace, you know, because <laughs> it's like, well, it's almost a lot of time. But it's interesting because your body has that intense um, flee. Um, yes. And then, of course, in my situation, it was like a 30 minutes gone back. So I didn't obviously you got to start going slower and these silly fish are following me. <laughs> it's kind of oh my gosh. But yeah, no, it's, but it's good because I know we talk about it further, further on, but how to, how I then was able to get back in the water afterwards, which is so important. You just got to yes. face these things head on. But I've had other circumstances where I've been hiking and fallen through a trap and just say, don't, you know, hold on, this, you know. But in that situation, I mean, it's shock. So yeah, well, I'd love to hear what you, what you talk about, like, how is the shock basically the disassociation is that yes that's yeah. basically what it is yeah that's your mm. that's your system trying to protect itself physically and emotionally from Amazing. what it thinks yeah. is it's inescapable danger yeah Jeez. absolutely Whew, that's intense but yeah you see how <laughs> your body like goes into these shifts um and sometimes mm. what can happen too especially if there has been trauma is um, you know, these things can happen. You can have that fear trigger with everyday things, or if there is a phobia, you know, mm. you can have that. So we're going to talk about phobias in a second, but that's the kind of thing. Like if I see a bee, my body yeah. immobilizes and I run like wow. regardless of what was happening, you know, it's like, cause it's, it's a fear response to a threat. So, you know, this is important to, to be able to understand those responses and also realize this isn't your body trying to hurt you. This is actually your body yeah. trying to help you and protect you, okay? So this isn't something to, like, hate about yourself or try to get rid of. This is something to get to know. Um, and so observing and describing fear. So we talked about this when we talked about when we were in emotion regulation, the importance of uh, Sherry, your camera's frozen on my side. I don't know if it is for everybody else. Could you turn your camera off and then back on and then it'll fix it? Yeah. There you are. You're back. Okay, not frozen anymore. <laughs> Amazing how that works. So observing and describing fear, right? Because the most of, the, the more that we can observe it non-judgmentally and put factual words on it, you know, number one, it helps us to get to know it better, but also, you know, the research shows that that can actually help to start to quiet that emotion. So this is an important thing to do. Um, and just looking at some of these situations where that might prompt fear, you know, the way that you might interpret it, um, the way, you know, what you experience in the body, fast heartbeat, rapid breathing, breathlessness, muscles tightening. As you can see, there's a very strong, strong physiological response to fear. Um, yeah. You know, fear and anger, I think those two have just such strong, you know, really strong physiological responses. Um, mm. Expression is running away, hiding, scream. It's supposed to be scream, not cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, sweating, 
you know, hair standing on end, nervous pacing. So there's, you know, this is how the body expresses it. And the more we do those things, remember from emotion regulation, the more that we express it, that we act on that emotion, it feeds the physiological part. Because emotions love themselves. So that's, it, it keeps it churning around. It keeps it moving. Um, you know, and then after the fact, we might find that our attention is narrowed. You know, example of this is, if you get into a near car accident or something like that, you find that after the fact, like after, you know, the fear is gone, the threat is gone, you might still be super focused, right? You're narrowing your attention for the rest of your drive and maybe afterwards. Um, continued hypervigilance, you might be kind of checking your mirrors even more. Um, so I'm sure that the next time, um, the next time you jumped into the water, you probably... We're like super aware, like looking everywhere. Is, or, yeah. Like, the fish coming out, like what's going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you might even find yourself ruminating about other things, imagining mm -hmm. loss. So these are some of the after effects that are natural that happen afterwards. You know, and the reason why it's, it's helpful is, you know, I think recognizing these things helps us to realize that this is just fear. Right? Yeah, it's kind of good. This is just fear. You know, if I had a near car accident and then I'm nervous about getting back in. Oops. The Siri just turned on. Um, and then I was nervous about getting back in the car. This doesn't mean that I'm weak or I'm, you know, any kind of judgment. It means that this is what happens after I've experienced fear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's why this is very important. Okay, so that's fear. Questions mm -hmm. about fear, and now we're gonna talk about anxiety. And then I'm gonna talk about what do we do with each of those. So I'm starting out kind of with what are they, and then what do we do with them? So that's fear, okay. Now, anxiety. Anxiety is different, right? So anxiety, I mean, they're in the same family, um, but they, they are different. So anxiety feels, it's unpleasant, it's diffuse, it's vague, it's this kind of like apprehension of, you know, the sense of not knowing, but having this looming threat. Um, that, you know, so we're not faced immediately with this. It's not something that I have to immediately escape. Um, but it's like, you know, walking into a dark alley and kind of being on edge because I don't know if something's gonna jump out at me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's kind of this sense that something bad might happen. And again, anxiety is not a bad thing. We don't want to get rid of it because it is good in some circumstances. I mean, it is helpful. If I'm walking in a dark alley, it's probably a really good thing that I'm alert right and aware that this could be dangerous does that make sense you know if yeah. i'm like yeah. walking somewhere alone at night or you know doing you know things where there might be some potential danger it's a good thing to have this anxiety because you know then i'm i am more aware and i'm i you know with that anxiety anxiety i am a little bit more hyper vigilant and i'm noticing things more yes. and I, I you know i'm kind of ready for action if I need to. Um, so it's a good purpose. It does. Mm. It's really, you don't want to get rid of this, okay? Um, but, so if you are not in acute physical danger, but you're feeling something similar to fear, then you're probably feeling anxiety, okay? So that's how you know the difference. Like, if, you, if there's mm. not, like, an immediate threat, but you are feeling something that's kind of like, you know, heart palpitations, tension, things like that, then you're probably feeling anxiety. Um, and anxiety, again, this is something that is not a problem unless it becomes really chronic, okay? And unless it starts to really interfere with your life and your enjoyment and you know your performance or your responsibilities, okay? So it's not, you know, it's not necessarily a problem unless it starts to become chronic. Okay, um, so those of you who do struggle with anxiety, it's, you know, I'm sure that you've observed that, you know, when it does start to be a problem. Um, and what it does is it, is it can kind of, we have this looming sense that 
something could happen at any time and there's a lot of what ifs and, and questions like that are happening. Now, anxiety, like I said before, feels a lot like fear, right? This restlessness, sense of doom, increased heart rate, dizziness, um, ringing in ears even, difficulty concentrating, sleeping. I know we talked about when we were talking about sleep, um, you know, a lot of times it's anxiety that comes up that keeps people up at night, Ru you know, ruminating, worry, feeling insecure, right? So these are all things that are anxiety-based, not as much fear-based, but anxiety-based. Yeah. And an example is, you know, one of the things that to kind of, um, I've told people a lot about my phobia of bees, right? So <laughs> it's still, and I don't have to fit, you know, the interesting thing is I don't face it as much in Miami. So, it, you know, when I'm in North Carolina, where I'm from, there are so many bees. There's incredible amount of bees and wasps and everything. It's out of control. <coughs> And so when I'm there, I'm constantly doing exposure. Just going outside every time I'm doing exposure practices. When I'm back in Miami, I rarely encounter bees and they're not very aggressive here. You know, they tend to kind of stay by them to themselves. So if it's been a year since I've been to North Carolina, all of a sudden I go back, you know, and I'm sitting there and I notice the anxiety coming up. So I'm gonna be going there in a few weeks and I notice anxiety about the bees. You know, when am I going to encounter one? Is it going to sting me? Is it going to chase me? You know, all the, that's anxiety. Whereas fear is when I actually encounter the bee. If that makes sense. Yeah. So yes. when I'm walking there yeah. and the, the bee actually comes at me, that is it. So Cindy says, what about anxiety that is present every moment? Cindy, great question. That is what we call generalized anxiety. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, good question. So we call that generalized anxiety or it's like free floating anxiety that's just there all the time. So we're going to talk about what to do with that. So, but before we do that, let's talk about fear. So with fear, the steps that we want to do with fear, number one, is the fear justified or unjustified? And we get to that by checking the facts. Okay. We get to that by checking the facts. And Chris says, mm -hmm. what triggers anxiety or an anxiety attack from nowhere? Great question, Krista. So um, anxiety is, well, an anxiety attack. You know, a lot of times this is kind of your body's alarm system um, misfiring. You know, and I'm not sure if you mean a pan panic attack. So a panic attack is a little bit different, but they can kind of, you know, be from the same nature and that it's, you know, it's your physiology and your brain kind of misinterpreting threat where there is no threat. So, you know, that, that is basically what that is. Um, now dealing with the physiology of your anxiety, like what we're going to talk about, um, yeah, well, an anxiety attack might be just where you kind of experience a lot of anxiety. A panic attack, a lot of times, you know, tends to be shorter and it tends to, you know, a lot of times people think they're having a heart attack. You know, the heart's mm -hmm. beating really, really fast. There's just this intense fear. Um, you know, there's, you know, basically an inability to function. It's, it's really, really intense. A lot of people develop actually, you know, a major fear of having those panic attacks too, right? So that actually, is, right, like, you know, in the same nature as, as like fear of fear, um, right? Or anxiety mm -hmm. about anxiety. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, this is probably your brain misfiring. Sometimes when there is kind of free floating anxiety too, when your nervous system is not quite at baseline, then a lot of times it could be anything that just kind of sets it off. Um, if you're not, if your brain is not already at baseline. So for example, and this is kind of what happens I'm going a little bit off topic, but that's okay. <laughs> well, it's actually not off topic, I'm going off slide. So let's say that this mm -hmm. where my hand is right here is baseline. So baseline, base, let's say baseline is neutral. 
with your with your neurophysiology. So that means you're not anxious, you're not depressed, right? So what can happen sometimes is we feel some anxiety, and then naturally what we want to happen is we feel some anxiety, and then we regulate it, and then we come back to baseline. And then we feel it again, and then it comes back down to baseline, right? That's kind of what we want to happen. But what can happen is we have our baseline here, and then we feel a little bit of anxiety, and then maybe it comes down enough so that we can then go function, but it doesn't return to neutral. So then, now we're functioning here, and this kind of becomes our new baseline. Does that make sense? And then what might happen is we get hit by something else that brings up anxiety, and then we get elevated again, right? And then maybe again, it kind of comes down a little bit, so we're able to kind of function there, but it doesn't go down to neutral. And what can happen is if 